Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim once again. Uh, thank you so much for attending my class today. Uh, InsyaAllah today I am with uh, group 3A. Eh? 3A. And today we will continue back where we left off in uh, chapter 1. So we will try to uh, do as much as chapter 1 and finish it off by the end of the day. Uh, if you are not, in, uh, if you're not uh, able to do so, then uh, we will just continue it next week. Uh, as I explained uh, in class yesterday, uh, this subject does not have a final exam. Okay, does not have final exam. So uh, you are assessed based on assignment, uh, quiz, group project, and one test. Okay, so most of your, uh, so all of your assessment will be done before your final, uh, before your final exam for other subjects. But for this subject, you do not have a final exam. Okay. Uh, you only have uh, assignment, quizzes, one test, and one group project. So the group project, you have to present and submit a report as well. Since this class is fully online, so the group project presentation, what I will normally ask students to do is uh, record a video, upload in YouTube for a maximum of maybe 15 to 20 minutes. At most, uh, well, I... Most I see students have done maximum about 20 minutes. 20 minutes or half an hour, yes. But not more than that. Okay, So that is your final presentation uh, group work. So your final presentation will take in 30%. Assignment, 20%. Quiz, uh, sorry, assignment about yeah 20%. Uh, quiz, another 30%. Uh, test, another, sorry, Quiz 20%, test 30%, and your final exam, uh, final presentation, sorry, final presentation another 30%. Okay, so that is the assessment for this semester. Uh, this semester, all our classes are done online uh, every Tuesday and every Wednesday. Uh, today afternoon, we will have the class for 3B. Okay, and my uh, attendance is all in your future. So, Abyss class or before class, you can just open your U-Future and take the uh, attendance in U-Future. Okay? Uh, if you're not able to do so or you forget uh, you forget to sign in your attendance, uh, please message me and let me know that, uh, yes, I have attended the class, but I, I totally forgot to sign in the attendance. Then I will just uh, I will record that as you have attended the class. No issues there. Anyway, Let's continue with uh, chapter 1. Okay. I hope you can see the slides. Okay. So, let me just go back, uh, refresh back what is chapter 1 all about. So, in chapter 1, the main objective of chapter 1 is for you to understand what is an operating system. That is the main objective. Okay. So, I'm hoping that by the end of this chapter 1, you're able to understand what is an operating system. 1. Number 2, <coughs> you are able to, uh, to identify what an operating system can do and cannot do. And you're also able to identify different types of computer system. So in chapter 1 and throughout this uh, course, you will see these two words coming up often. Operating system and computer system. For a operating system to actually work, it needs to be installed, it needs to be stored inside a computer system. Okay? And there are several types of computer system. The most basic one is what you are looking at now. You're looking at your laptop, you're looking at your desktop. That is the basic computer system. But we also have mobile systems. Some of you are maybe uh, are today online using your mobile, your mobile devices. Some of you maybe are using your tablets. So that is well, that, that as well is a uh, a mobile. Sorry, it's a computer system by itself. Okay, and we also have different types of computer systems, such as embedded computer system, whereby it only does one process. For example, when you go to the checkout counter in a Tesco and you go to the counter to pay, 
So you see a machine there, a counter. So that is a dedicated machine only for uh, buying goods and services. Okay, uh, ATM machine when you take out and withdraw your money. So that is also a computer system. Okay, so let's go back and see where we left out yesterday. We were at. Okay, we were here. So in this chapter, in these slides, we are going to understand how the computer system boots up. Okay, that means from zero, it boots up until you see the first screen. This um, is also similar to booting up on your handphones as well, mobile devices as well. And it's similar to even if you are booting your Astro decoder box, similar, okay? Inside any computer system, inside any embedded system, example, eh? inside any of these systems, embedded computer system, mainframe, workstation, uh, computer, embedded computer in my automobiles, mini computers, handheld devices, you can do booting up. And inside all of these machines, there are two things which are very, very common to you, RAM and ROM. Okay? All of these have their own RAM and ROM. So when you boot up a machine, when you start the machine for the first time, okay, there are certain files taken out from the ROM. Okay? Taken out from the ROM. ROM is, is a permanent uh, hardware inside your your device there is no possibility of you increasing the rom size rom size is given to you it is you cannot uh, increase the size as you go on however in a normal computer system yes you can increase the ram size your laptop you can increase the ram size your desktop you can increase the ram size but you cannot <laughs> increase the ram size inside your Mobile device. Uh, mobile device, you cannot do that. A mobile device, Samsung, Huawei, iOS, there is no possibility of you to buy a new RAM and install it inside. No, it is not. The technology has not come yet. Okay, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but who knows? As we speak, somebody is developing this. Oh, we don't know yet. But as for now, for mobile devices, there is no possibility of you increasing the RAM size. So that is why whenever you buy a new phone, whenever you look at a new phone, there are two main basic things that you look for. One is you are looking at the RAM. How big is the RAM and how big is the ROM? Why do you look at these two? Because the earlier phones, earlier mobile devices has smaller ROM size. Well, the ROM size does not give any effect on the booting, but it stores more files. Why does it store more files? Is because for the new types of phone, there are so many, there are a lot of applications to be to be um, looked at when it boots up. Okay, so it needs a slightly bigger ROM. Okay, but the most important thing is you need to look at your RAM size of the phone. Why is this important? Because as you know, as we go along, there are so many, many, many mobile applications coming out. And some of these applications are big and they need faster processing. So when you are talking about faster processing, then you need a better RAM uh, storage. You need a bigger RAM storage. That is why sometimes over time, over two years, three years using your phone, you suddenly say, ah, phone is getting slow. Two possibilities. One is you have taken too many pictures in your hard disk and you have never cleared it. And number two, your RAM is getting full. Why is it getting full? Is because most of the mobile applications these days require bigger storage space in their RAM and they, are more, uh, they, uh, they run much more faster and they need faster processing. So when you're talking about faster processing, we are also talking about a bigger RAM size. Okay, and number two, when you buy your mobile phone, what do you look at? You look at the camera. I'm sure all of you do that. Oh, how many pixels? What can it do? Does it have filter? And so on and so forth. Okay, so number two, camera. Yes, if you're doing TikTok, if you're doing uh, 
what do you say, uh, you're taking pictures of yourself, you're taking selfies of yourself all the time, then you look at your camera. Lah, okay? But most importantly, you look at your RAM size. So coming back to computer system, so in the computer system, we have the RAM and we have the ROM. Okay? ROMs are permanent files. So what files are inside the ROM? Okay, so inside the ROM, there is something called the firmware. Okay, so when we say boot up, reboot, that means we are looking at something which is called the bootstrap program. The bootstrap program is inside the ROM and it is actually built in inside the ROM and it only activates whenever you, rest, uh, you start your PC. It's only one time only one time when you start your pc yes okay so there are several types of file that needs to be taken out from the rom okay we'll go into that maybe not in this chapter but in the next chapter we look at what is the exact process and the best part of rom is it's the same file for all operating systems let us say today you buy a laptop running on windows 10 windows 11 Tomorrow, as you go on, you feel that, ah, this is not right. You want to install a new uh, operating system. You want to install uh, Linux. Then you go in ahead and install Linux. But your ROM is still there because ROM is permanent. And it cannot be deleted. So, the ROM files are always the same. It's not different. However, you can only install operating systems such as like from Windows to Linux to Unix so on and so forth but you cannot re you cannot suddenly install iOS in your PC that's totally different because the architecture is totally different okay so what is kernel then as you look at point number three operate loads operating system kernels and start execution kernel is something is a file which is actually the brain of the operating system okay so as I mentioned yesterday in class Application software is Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Okay. But who controls this application software? Is the operating system. Now, persoalannya, who controls the operating system? It is the kernel who controls the operating system. Where, where is this kernel coming from? The kernel is coming from the ROM. Okay. The kernel is coming from the ROM. Okay. Let's go on. Okay. So this is how a basic computer system looks like. Okay, so you have your CPU there. So inside your CPU is where the motherboard is. What is the motherboard? It's a gigantic chip, which is embedded with a mother. <coughs> sorry, it's embedded with the uh, CPU. Sorry, it's embedded with the processor. So the motherboard and the processor is what we say as the CPU. This controller, what does it do? <coughs> It controls your hard disk. Okay, each of these controllers <coughs> controls a specific hardware. So USB controller controls the mouse, the keyboard, the printer. Okay, and graphic controller controls the graphic. Okay, graphic controller controls the graphic. Lah. Your HDMI, your VGA. So these are all connected to the graphics con adapter or controller. Yeah, you can say. Yeah, both are this, uh, both does the same thing. So why do we need to have this controller or adapter? For each hardware, <coughs> we need to have an adapter or controller simply because, okay, these adapters or controllers will actually control, will actually keep track of what is going on with that particular hardware. Okay, and all of this is connected to the RAM. Always remember, <clears throat> whenever you run any program, the program is running actually from, the program is being processed at the CPU, but the files are stored inside the memory. Let's say you open your Microsoft Word. First, you have to locate your file. Your file is inside your My Document. Okay. <clears throat> so, the Word document is opened and is transferred inside the memory first. Next is transferred inside the CPU to be processed. Apa nak buat dengan file ni? Oh, this file needs to be appearing in the monitor. So, 
the, uh, the CPU sends a signal through this line here, which is called the, com the common bus, and appears inside the monitor over here. Okay, so the memory keeps the file while the file is being utilized by the user. So that is how the computer system organization looks like and works. Okay, what can a uh, computer system operation do? What is it all about? Input output devices and the CPU can execute concurrently. Input output device. What is an input output device? The keyboard is an input. Monitor is an output. So these are uh, devices and can do it concurrently. Why do you say concurrently? If you type something on your keyboard as an input, concurrently, immediately, it appears in your monitor. Imme immediately, it appears on your screen. So that is why, that is how the input-output device and the CPU works concurrently. Each device, uh, which is the hardware, is in charge of that particular device. Each device is in charge of the particular device. Each device has a local buffer. Yes, each device has a local buffer. What does that mean? That means, uh, you go back to the previous slide, graphic, and gra monitor, you have a graphic adapter. Dalam graphic adapter, inside the graphic adapter, there's a buffer, there's a small memory space. Why is that? Because, for example, let's say you are doing, you're watch, you're, you're doing, um, or you watch a movie, for example. So the CPU will process it first, send it to the uh, graphic, send it to the graphic controller to be uploaded inside the screen monitor. But the movie actually, the, the, the files of the movie is actually stored inside the graphic controller. It is not taking space from the memory. Okay. Next, CPU moves data to, from, to main memory and to local buffers. So which local buffer are we talking about? Each of the hardware device has local buffer. Uh, input output is from the device to the local buffer of controller. Okay, this is also similar. Device controller informs CPU that it has finished its operation by causing interrupt. Okay. Whenever, let's say, for example, printer. Printer is connected to the USB controller. So once printer has finished its um, printing, it will send back a signal, which is called an interrupt, to let the CPU know, yes, I have finished printing. And sometimes the CPU will translate this and come out in a message for the user to know as well. Or if, there, let's say, while printing, there's some error, paper jam or something like that, so the printer will send an interrupt signal back to the buffer, back to the CPU to inform CPU, hey, there's something wrong with the printing. Okay, so there are six operations provided by the computer system. They will highlight those. It is not, we are not talking about operating system, it is the computer system that we are talking about. Okay, so what are the common types of interrupt? Other interrupt, which is called the interrupt vector, other interrupt, which is called the software interrupt. Interrupt vector is an interrupt, is a hardware interrupt. Meaning to say, printer, there's some error, paper tak ada, that is a hardware interrupt. So, it comes up with an interrupt vector. What is an interrupt vector? Vector is an address provided by the device because it has to tell CPU what to do next. So, CPU does not know what to do next. So, that's why the printer will send an interrupt vector, an address of what instructions to do. Okay, sekarang ni, in, in other words, the printer is telling the CPU, okay, now, my there's a paper jam, sila buat instructions pada address, the instruction is located in address number 24. So the CPU will get this address, will look up inside memory, address 24 ni apa? Oh, oh, I have to come up with a, uh, with a message to the user. Okay. So interrupt vector is an interrupt with an address, containing address to tell, what, to tell the CPU what to do next. That is interrupt vector. Interrupt vector always happens from hardware, not software. If it's a software generator, let's say you're doing your work, tiba-tiba blue screen. Blue screen too normally is a software interrupt. 
Okay, there's somewhere, there's a problem lah. Contohnya, even if you do, uh, you're doing programming, you want C++ ke Java ke, and let's say there's an error message. So that is called a trap. Okay, generated by software, not hardware. So even this will be sent to the CPU for what to do next. So this kind of trap or a problem or interrupt is called interrupt driven. Okay, why is it called interrupt driven? Because it's driven by the software. So what does the uh, CPU have to do is the CPU has to look into the look into the interrupt and look at the possible solutions. So the solutions for interrupt driven is much it takes longer to solve. Sebab the CPU has to go down and find out apa nak buat ni, what is the actual problem as compared to interrupt vector. Interrupt vector dah ada dah address dia. Okay, from up. If you have any questions, please uh, let me know. Eh? I, I hope all of you are okay because I'm talking alone here. Okay, so how does it, <coughs> how does the CPU handle interrupt, uh, or how does interrupt being, being handled by the computer system or the operating system? Well, the operating system preserves the state of the CPU by storing the register and the program counter, determines which type of interrupt. Is it vector or pooling? Pooling pun sama lah. Pooling is another word for interrupt-driven eh, software. Okay. Separate segments of code determine what action should be taken. So, when an interrupt happens, let's say, printer lah. Senang sikit lah kita. Printer. So, Printer sends an interrupt vector to the CPU, telling that, okay, paper habis. That's also a problem. So, please execute vector number four. Vector number four is an address telling the CPU what to do next. But before that, the CPU will keep what was the printer doing. Let's say the printer, the page, of, uh, the print of the page four. So, the CPU will keep that inside the memory so that the next time bila they print, they continue balik daripada page 5 or 4 sahaja. Okay? So that is why the operating system preserves the state. Uh, so the only, this is where the operating system comes in. Okay? The operating, operating system punya job is to preserve it. Okay? Preserve what uh, what was the last job that the printer was doing. Okay? Then determine what to do next Finally, okay, what action should be taken or perform the action lah. So, pertama, how do you handle interrupt is first save the current position. Current state tu kena save dulu. Next, determine is it pooling, is it software or is it vector. Okay, now it's vector. And then, what action should be taken. Tiga senang je. It's as if like this lah. You come and see your lecturer because you have a problem. First, the lecturer will keep, okay, what? Who are you? Let's do determine. Okay, what was your last job? Okay, they will keep this. Okay, now what's your problem? Oh, my problem is this. So the lecturer will decide, is this a severe problem? Not severe problem. If it's a severe problem, point number three, what to do next? If it's a not severe problem, what to do next? But the lecturer has already kept. Oh, sebelum tadi, dia tengah buat benda ni. Okay, the save dulu, save dulu. Okay, so this is how interact vector is being handled. Okay, so interrupt timeline, this is how the CPU processing is done, the timeline. So when there is a request to the CPU, the line is straight and when there's an interrupt being uh, transferred down, the, the time moves a bit more. Lah. Okay, ada masa lebih sikit. So this is only the timeline sahaja. Okay, so this you have in, in this slide, we are talking about the I.O. structure, the input-output structure. Uh, this happens when the interrupt is from an input-output. What does that mean? Meaning, uh, there is a problem from the input or output. Because interrupt can happen two ways. Because I think I forgot to explain to you. It's either, for example, pro, uh, interrupt, printer is printing, printer harvest paper. Okay? So, number one, two, interrupt. First, interrupt yang kedua is belum start print. 
printer out cable not connected that is also an interrupt so in this slide okay it shows you what to do or how does the operating system handle an interrupt before it starts working sebab macam printer tadi dah, uh, it has done five pages and then only the interrupt happens but there could be also a, a, a situation whereby the job has not been performed dah ada interrupt for example awak nak masuk my webex uh, class but tak dapat masuk so that is before another situation is you dah masuk dah and then there's a problem okay so how do you handle this bo uh, bo uh, both of this so we have something called a system call request the os to allow user to wait because they they can also be multiple interrupts so the uh, so the operating system will decide now which which interrupt must be done first so they have a something which is called a system call a system call request the os to allow user so it allows user to wait first okay now this interrupt cannot be completed because there's some other problem so allow this interrupt to wait for a while okay and mungkin there are also more than one interrupt so the operating system will keep it inside something called a device table a device status table to keep all the interrupts and process one by one according to the queue next we also are going to look at in the next chapter something called direct memory access okay direct memory access is whereby okay is whereby it is like this lah. I give you an example. So from this example, you can understand. For example, when you download a few things from the internet, what happens? First, download uh, the, the material come and the material is processed by the CPU first. Why is that so? Anything which comes down needs to be processed by the CPU first. So the CPU pro uh, process it and then only it goes to the memory what memory I'm talking about? The RAM. And then it goes into the hard disk. Okay, then it goes into the hard disk. But, if the CPU detects you have, you are, uh, you are downloading a big chunk of file, then the operating system will cut that process and directly, tak payah pergi CPU, terus masuk RAM and terus masuk so now, I always have this question. To the Tanya, kenapa nak pergi RAM dulu? Okay, they understand. Yes, CPU because CPU will determine what to do next. Kenapa nak pergi RAM? Any process which comes, which is being handled by the computer system, needs to be put inside the RAM. Example, slide yang saya tengok sekarang ni, is inside the RAM actually. It's not coming from the hard disk. Yes, the original file is in the hard disk. But when I double click the file, the file is now being transferred inside your uh, inside your RAM. And then only CPU. CPU the process. Lah. Uh, and then, patah balik. Okay. So when your direct memory access is a service provided by the operating system, if you're downloading or if you're copying large amount of files, because when you are copying large amount of files, you not masuk kepada CPU. The CPU kata, okay, mau masuk kepada RAM. And then now RAM masuk kepada uh, apa namanya, hard disk. It's going to take a long time. So now CPU says, okay, so operating system says, okay, now since it's a big file, so we just bypass the CPU and straight into the uh, memory. So this is way much faster. So this is direct memory access. Don't worry. We'll be covering uh, covering this in the next uh, chapter, chapter two and uh, three as well. So you can get a, uh, chapter one is just to give you an introduction of what is a direct memory access storage. Okay, so obviously you know there are certain uh, there are two types of storage and there are several storage main memory. Okay, when we talk about main memory, what do I mean by main memory? Main memory means your memory lah, which is your RAM. When I say secondary storage or hard disk, secondary storage means your hard disk lah. Okay. <coughs> Random access typically volatile. What is volatile? Volatile means once you off your PC, data disappears. Secondary storage is your hard disk. Okay. Your USB. So these are secondary storage. This is non-volatile, meaning 
the, 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 the data remains there. Lah. Okay. And then we also have certain types of examples. Other examples, we have magnetic disk. Okay. These are uh, big storage. Okay. So how they keep it is they have sectors, they have blocks inside the uh, hard disk. Lah. Okay. And uh, we also have uh, SSD. SSD are now the latest one. They are much more faster uh, because it, the, 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 the turning of the hard disk is way much faster. So that is why, uh, kalau you compare dulu uh, desktop lama-lama or laptop lama-lama, bila you on tu, it takes a longer time because you nak baca file dalam hard disk tu, it's on SSD. Uh, sorry, it's not on SSD. Now with SSD, now it's way much faster lah. But now technology has changed under something lagi like uh, a bit more, a bit something more uh, faster than SSD. So, <clears throat> Okay, so when you look at your hierarchy of storage, you're looking at your speed, cost, and volatile. So these are the criteria of storage devices. How fast, how much does it cost, and is it volatile or non-volatile? So if it's volatile, we are talking about your RAM. Okay, so now when, even when you buy your phone, you look at your RAM size on the phone. And you also look at how fast is the RAM size as well. You got and you are looking at laptops, you are also looking how fast is the RAM size. Not only the size of the RAM, but you are looking how fast is that RAM. Okay? And you are looking at whether it's volatile or non-volatile. So if it's volatile, then you are looking at your RAM. If it's non-volatile, then you are looking at your hard disk. Okay? Then we are also looking at cache. Copying information into faster uh, storage device. Memory can be viewed as cache for secondary memory. A cache memory is normal is basically inside the CPU. It's a small type of memory inside the CPU. Okay, so it keeps small number of data. Contohnya macam uh, when you're surfing the net, kan, you're moving from one page to another page. Okay, and then you back pale, and then you move forward. Okay, all those pages is actually kept inside a cache page. So that's why whenever you uh, finish your using your PC, sometimes they, they tell you that, okay, clear your cache as well. Device driver for each device controller to manage I.O., okay, input output. So each uh, device hardware inside your PC connected to your PC needs to have a device controller. So the device controller actually controls each and every uh, device hardware connected to the PC. Okay, so this is the hierarchy. Fastest is register, cache, main memory, SSD, magnetic, optical, and magnetic tapes as well. Okay, magnetic ni macam dulu lah yang cassette tu. So this is the hierarchy. Okay, ini bukan maksud dia registers are small. Yes, registers are sizes small and magnetic tape besar. But it also shows that the higher it goes, the much, much more faster it Okay, so this you can read on your own. This is about cache. And this is about the computer system. Alright, so when we look at computer system, there are several types of computer system. But what we are looking at in computer system, we are looking at two terms, uh, which is called the multiple multiprocessor. So multiprocessor is very simple. You look at the word, it means multi processor meaning you have multiple cpus running at one point one one time okay so by young guy you have few uh, laptops all connected together and running at one time so you can assume that the speed is going to be very very fast so this is called can also be called as a parallel system it runs all together at once why do we have a multi-processor okay because we want to increase the throughput what is throughput Throughput is the number of processes that we can be completed in one cycle. Okay, that means macam ni lah. In, in your PC, this is a single processor. You can open Word, PowerPoint, YouTube, so many uh, applications at one point of time. But in uh, bigger institutions like banks, they need a faster uh, processing so that they use the concept of multiple or multi-processor a few processes running at a time so that they can complete, uh, they can increase their throughput. Economy of scale meaning this uh, multi-processor can be expanded and 
uh, at any point of time because you just add on CPUs, okay? Uh, increased reliability, yes. That means it's much more reliable. That means uh, the, the machine won't shut down. The machine won't get, uh, won't uh, fail you at any point because you are running so many machines at one particular point in time. As compared to if you are running one PC like this, let's say you're running something which is very, very heavy, a program which is very, very big, then you might have some issues uh, running at running running this problem okay so you uh, inside multiprocessor there are two types of uh, system and subsystems as well one is called the asymmetrical multiprocessing and another one is symmetrical multiprocessing okay we will cover this in the next chapter but please read on this you must know the difference between asymmetrical and symmetrical and these two types of Processing comes under the multiprocessing. Okay, multiprocessing. Okay, multiprocessing is basically you have a few CPUs running at one point of time, but you can also have dalam multiprocessing. You can also have asymmetrical or symmetrical. Please read on this, and we'll cover this more in the next chapter. Okay, I hope you you should read on this. Huh? this is your assignment for today. How a computer system works, a uh, modern uh, computer works like. This is, I think you have covered this in uh, CSC 159 last time, or maybe the introduction of, uh, of this uh, degree course in, in uh, previous lectures or previous sub subjects. Okay, uh, you should be able to know this how the CPU works. Okay, so you have several types of this. Okay, this is an example of what I said, uh, what I told you now. Symmetrical multiprocessing, as you can see, all the CPUs are here, registers, but as you can see here, they are all connected to only one memory. Symmetrical, S, symmetrical, that means all of these PCs only have one memory. Asymmetrical multiprocessing, all of these are connected, they all are independent, but all are connected only. Okay, that means if you go to the computer lab, that is a asymmetrical multiprocessing okay all of that is connected through your network cables okay uh, this is another form a uniform uh, model as well okay this is also symmetrical multiprocessing we have the clustered system okay uh, clustered system is uh, normally used inside the computer labs all computer systems, all the computers are connected through network cables. That means you can transfer data from one computer to another computer simply by using the uh, network cables. This is how a clustered system looks like. And operating system structure, okay, I think this is all. So I will leave you uh, here, okay, I will leave you here for today, where will you, okay, uh, I will leave you here today, okay, and operating system structures, I think this is a bit too heavy for you today, because as you can see, uh, this subject is mostly on theoretical base, okay, on theory, a lot of reading, so you have to uh, uh, vision yourself, lah. okay, so I won't uh, talk about uh, operating system structures just yet, I will continue this on uh, class okay and i think we should we should stop here for today uh, do you have any questions to ask me uh yes sir yes, sir where will you provide the recorded video so, uh, i have uploaded yesterday's recorded video on you future okay uh, so the link is there is all in youtube you, you just take the link uh, from the uh, youtube uh, attendance you can see i already put there Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. What's your name, by, by the way? Uh, for Dallas. Okay, I can see you. Okay, all right. All right. Thank you so much for today. Uh, inshallah, once this recording is done, complete uh, is done, I will save it inside YouTube and put the YouTube link inside the new future. Okay? All right. Okay, sir. Thank you so much for today. Inshallah, I will see you uh, next class, next Tuesday. Uh, if I don't, uh, just before that, Selamat berpuasa to you, to me, and uh, we, today is Wednesday, so we have about three more days to eat. 
So make sure you uh, cepat-cepatlah makan McDonald's ke apa-apa yang patut so that we are not hungry next week. Alright, thank you so okay. much. Uh, siapa-siapa yang tak ganti puasa tu, make sure you ganti your puasa. Eh? Alright, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.